Uh, good morning, folks. We're going to go ahead and get started with some announcements. It is uh, great to see you all this morning after a, a kind of shaky morning last week. Oh, my goodness. It is, it is good to be back together with more members of the congregational family. I have a number of announcements I'd like to share with you. Please bear with me this morning. Um, February newsletters, hopefully you saw, if you normally pick up one here at the church with your mailing label on it, uh, they are back there for the taking. The ones in the mail are on their way, and we'll be getting the emailed copies out this week coming as well. So February newsletter uh, coming, coming at you and back here if you normally get a hard copy here at church. We have again this morning a couple of large print bulletins. You may remember we've been trying that as kind of an experiment for about a month. And basically what Becky and I have been seeing is it doesn't seem like they're really ending up being used as far as we can tell. And, and that's okay. I mean, that's not a problem. But basically in the name of good stewardship, we don't want to be doing them and then putting them in the recycling each week. So unless I get any other feedback for right now, we're going to just put that on hiatus and not be doing the large print. Um, and we can always decide to do that again later as well. So nothing's forever. But if you would have a different thought about that, please let me know or let Becky know and, and we will uh, rethink that. Um, last week in the congregational meeting, which uh, again was, was very low represented because of the weather, uh, we did look over the annual report for 2018. And those reports, there should still be copies downstairs by the guest book where we normally put the bulletins and extra newsletter copies. So I'd encourage you please each to pick up one, one per household is the idea, where you'll see the treasurer reports, reports from Miss Laurie and from me about the ministry that we've been involved in during 2018 and so forth. But I wanted to share uh, two, th three things. Um, one is, in answer to a question last week, uh, it was noted that in the report on the memorials fund that had the balances of the, of the various investments, that the Thrivent investment was listed as being December 31st of 2017, and it seemed lower than it probably ought to be. And the answer to that is that simply was not available yet when Jamie did her report. So we were still carrying over a prior balance. And that is higher as of December 31st, 2018. But again, that simply was not on hand, had not arrived yet when uh, Jamie needed to get her report in. So that's the short answer. The full amount, the 1231 amount, will be coming to council at the next meeting in Jamie's regular ongoing report. And then I, I wanted to highlight for those who weren't at the meeting, um, it can be kind of hard sometimes to make out in the pages of numbers, well, you know, how did we do? What was the what was the bottom line? You know, like you and I would want to know about our home checkbook. You know, did we did we lose money during the year? You know, do we have less in bank now than we did? You know, where are we when it comes to looking at the year as a whole? And um, I, I'm happy to report, really, um, that in the case of the current fund, that's the the big overarching fund. You know, where we pay the light bill and the heat and my salary and all those kinds of things. Um, in the current fund for the year 2018, we ended up about $2,300 short. In other words, our expenses exceeded our income by about $2,300. And as I was saying to folks last week, that's never exactly something to write home about. Hey, we lost $2,300, guess what? You know, no, it's not like that. But in church life, in the scheme of Christian congregations, that's pretty par for the course. Uh, by and large, congregations, uh, I think maybe by God's intent, it, it keeps us humble, it keeps us focused. Um, we don't end up rolling in money in that way. So the fact that we were about $2,300 short means that our bank balance came down by that amount during the year, but because we have a sufficient balance, no monies needed to be transferred from memorials interest or anything like that. And were we to have a similar experience this year, and we hope maybe we won't, uh, we would still be okay in that regard. Um, but I, I just wanted you to know, you know, in the scheme of the whole budget, that's kind of right down the middle of the pipe. We've had better years, and we've had very much worse years. And as I talk to my Christian colleagues and neighbor congregations, that's really a pretty good place to end up. 
compared to what many Christian congregations are struggling with. The other update that I would give you concerns the Children and Youth Ministry Fund, which is again the larger fund through which we take care of the expenses of Ms. Laurie's ministry. And in that case, you'll see in Jamie's report that we did indeed transfer money from Memorial's interest into the account to pay the bills. But the good news is we transferred significantly less than we would have expected. And we ended up during 2018 taking in almost $7,000 more dollars from your offerings and mine than we anticipated. Uh, we, we tried not to get like irrationally crazy thinking we're going to just get all kinds of money all of a sudden and we tried to be pretty conservative and what we saw during 2018 as the year before is that your giving and mine working together exceeded what we were looking for and in last year's case that was by about seven thousand dollars so that is that is really pretty cool now as i say that we don't want to exactly rest on our laurels because this year the plan is that we are cutting back, again, $5,000 less support from Memorial's interest. So the bottom line is, with where we ended up last year, we already almost had that in hand, basically. But we're going to have to keep growing, because the plan is that eventually no more transfers, and it's something that we handle through your offerings and mine. So very encouraging, a very good result but not to say mission accomplished or, you know, well, we got this, you know, we're all set. It's, it's a good marker along the way with still more work to be done. So, so thank you for a very good and a very solid year of working together in God's name. And the report will tell you about so many different ways in which that happened, but those are a couple I wanted to mention. Um, if you would, in the calendar of the week ahead, please note that I'm going to be uh, headed to a couple of medical appointments on Wednesday and on Friday morning. Uh, so my plan is to take work along in those cases, you know as well as I do, that those involve a lot of sitting and, and dead time. Uh, but I will not be in the office the way I normally would be this week. It's going to be a weird week in that regard. And so thank you for your understanding and working with me. And obviously, please, if I'm not here one of those mornings and you're looking to be in contact, Call me back, let a message, email me, you know, whatever is easiest for you, we'll, we'll keep in contact. Uh, the folks working on the usher list for 2019, those are Lois and Louise and Tam Spiker. Uh, they would like to hear from you if you would be willing to help serve as lay ushers, uh, working with a, a council a head usher. Uh, they're putting that list together. If, if you uh, would stand up and say, here I am, you know, send me like the prophet Isaiah, they will be delighted because that will make their work simpler and more joyful. Um, and there's, it's an important job, but not a complicated one. So please, if you would like to know more, again, speak with Lois or Louise or Tam. And of course, if you would like to volunteer, please see them. Next Sunday morning, we will be welcoming members of Cub Scout Pack 86. It's again, our annual observance of Scout Sunday. So come on out to welcome them. And when you do, be prepared for the folks with the soup bowls afterwards. It is Super Bowl, S-O-U-P-E-R Bowl Sunday, as well as Super Bowl, S-U-P-E-R Sunday. Looking a little further down the road, the 10th of February, please note that the youth are again leading worship that day. Um, our speaker for the morning, our preacher for the morning, has already been hard at work. But because of the way everything got backlogged for me, I have not really been making my calls yet in lining up other youth to plug in various places. I will be, that, that's the plan, that's this week's kind of top emphasis. But uh, don't be alarmed if you haven't heard from me yet. Normally you would have by now, I'm way behind, I'm sad to say. I will be in touch with other youth group members about worship leadership on February 10. And again, we would look for your support in that morning. And it's a great day because following that will be the February breaking bread. And that's a great time of fellowship and food, all of which benefits the ministry of the Upper Dolphin Area Snack Pack program. Finally, in our prayers this morning, um, I would ask you please, in addition to the list as we have it in the bulletin, uh, please also remember Mary and Tom Hassinger, uh, that, that being Sandy and, and Dale's brother Tom, his wife Mary. Uh, Mary's father died on Friday after uh, a, a struggle with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. 
And so please keep them in your thoughts and prayers across the miles as they deal with the death of Mary's dad. Um, please be sure to sign the card for Eric Matter that is in the back. Eric is still at Harrisburg Hospital. Did have a successful procedure on Wednesday to withdraw almost a liter of fluid from around his heart, uh, which obviously will cause some pretty serious problems. Um, that is doing better, but the question, the issues the doctors are still working on is, you know, what made that happen? Let's make sure there's nothing else going on. Let's make sure that doesn't happen again. So if you would please be sure to sign Eric's card and add your prayers to our prayers for him at Harrisburg Hospital. Also, Bob Schaefer, just early this morning, Bob was taken by ambulance to Harrisburg. Um, he's still in the emergency room at this time. Uh, he had gone down having chest pains, which nitroglycerin seemed to deal with pretty well, but he's definitely going to be staying around there a day or two at least for them to check him out more thoroughly. So we're glad that he was resting comfortably after that discomfort. And we do have a card back there for Bob as well, if you would be sure to sign it. And then finally, a third card, a different one, is a, a card of thanks. And that is to John Henninger, Mr. John Henninger, whose company, Optolumen, as you hopefully heard in, in the past weeks, was responsible for the donation of the LED light strips that make up our new high-tech stars on the steeple uh, that are much safer to install, no comparison, are much simpler to install, no comparison, and use nothing like the energy that we used to use from all the individual light bulbs. So uh, we are so grateful that John and his company were kind enough to make that donation, and the property committee thought it might be a really nice idea to send one of our really wonderful St. John cards that everyone signs by way of saying thank you. So all three of those cards, for Eric, for Bob, and the thank you for John Henninger, you should find back on the stand with the bulletins. Be sure, if you would, to add your signature to them. And yes, Janet Denlinger, president of the women. Thank you, Janet. And we will be winging it a little bit. The kitchen construction project will be down to the wire by that time, but it may well be that we end up doing a little bit of jockeying around to work around some issues still in, under, were underway in the kitchen. And if you get a chance, please check out my office, the conference room, Miss Laurie's room, which is directly down under this corner, and also the restroom out there by the elevator. Uh, and see the hard work that members of property committee have done these past couple of weeks in uh, some really great painting and refurbishing. Just, just check it out and you'll see what I mean. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to behold. Now to Judy on the bench for this morning's prelude.
i meant to mention you know there's kind of a popular thing now programs and books where you can kind of pick the ending that you want to pursue and it turns out differently we thought we would do the same thing for the hymns this morning for the middle hymn you can pick either 314 317 or 3142 which who knew there were that many hymns right um, the correct answer of course is i guess it is 314 so hymn number 314 will be the middle hymn this morning contrary to other information you may come across number 314 over there is the winner would you please stand now uh, page 94 is where we find the order for confession and forgiveness we begin by preparing our hearts for worship we gathered this day in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen god of all mercy and consolation come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we're now seated for the readings from God's Word. chapter 8. The exiles have returned and rebuilt Jerusalem. Now Ezra, the priest, reads the law of Moses to them in the public square. When they hear it, they weep for their sins and for the long years in exile, but Ezra reminds them that the joy of the Lord is their strength. All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra 
brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read, it, he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the women, of the men and the women, and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive, attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard from the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine, and send por portions of them to those whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to, to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here is the first reading. Here is the response to Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim its maker's handiwork. One day tells the tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. Their sound is gone out into the wilderness, and their message is comes forth like a bri bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the heavens to the end of the heavens, and runs about to the end of the end. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revises the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and the joys of the heart. The hand of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than the world, more than the shining world, sweeter than the water and the honey, than the honey. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own presence, and from my secret thoughts? Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get domain, dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. The second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 31a. The apostle and pastor Paul uses the metaphor of the human body to describe how intimately connected we are in the church. For this struggling congregation or in Corinth, Paul delivers a vital message of unity that is a mark of the church today. For just as a body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, 
and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, which one of them, as he chose, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no decession with, within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. All suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And the first and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. Here ends the second reading. According to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Luke writes, Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, we're going to turn things over to Miss Laurie and her even more famous sidekick, Son oh, did I say, oh, Sonny and Miss Laurie. And following Miss Laurie's time with us, please remember again, Hymn 314 will be that middle hymn today. Okay. Um, while I'm getting Sunny ready, I'm going to need a couple of helpers. So, Barry, since you got me on, it's going up. Tim Spiker. 
Sonny was going to go to do the sermon, so since it, we had a snow day, and there weren't that many people here, Pastor Tom and I decided, okay, we'll, we'll save it for next week. But so the sermon is going to be more related to last week's gospel, which was about the Jesus' first miracle at the wedding banquet. So we're going to start by having a pizza party. Yay! So each one of you want to take a slice of pizza. And now, uh, go ahead, pretend to take a bite. Stop! What's the matter tonight? Well, that's why we were going to eat it the wrong way. Oh, I see what you're saying, son. What were they going to do? Well, they were going to eat it from the point. Uh-huh. And if you start at the point, what do you get in your last bite? Yes, you get the crust. And everyone knows that the gooey and sauce and cheese, that's the best part. Right? Right. right. So we're going to teach you a better way. We're going to teach everybody a better way to eat pizza than anything that's kind of shaped like a triangle like that. So, okay, I'm listening. So the crust is okay, but the gooey, gooey part is first. So if you start by eating the crust first, what do you say for last? Oh, Tim, you're right. You say the best for a laugh. Very good. All right, you can put your pizza down, and uh, thanks for your help. So we're going to talk about saving the best for last. Good job, Tim. Thanks so much for your help, guys. Well, boys, you didn't do much, but Tim, thanks so much. <laughs> so that reminds me of the gospel reading for last week. One day, Jesus went to a wedding. And his mother was there, and so were most of his disciples. And everyone was having a really good time until the wedding guys ran out of wine. Oh, that sure was the damn wrong thing's done to Miss Laurie. No more wine! I know, how do you know? I know, I've just been at one of your parties. Well, no, 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 exactly. But the party was, was about to be ruined when Jesus' mother went to him and asked him to help. And then she told the servants, do whatever Jesus tells you. So it's wrong now that you got more? No, not this time. You see, nearby, there were six stone water jars, and they each were holding about 20 or 30 gallons of water. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So the servants filled the jars to the brim. And then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did as they were told. And when the master of the banquet tasted the water, guess what? To wine. No way! Yeah, and not only that, it was the very best wine that they had tasted all evening. The master of the banquet called the bridegroom aside and said, well, Most people serve the best wine first and save the cheap wine till the end after everybody's had too much to drink. But you have saved the best for last. Uh, now I see how you're tying this all together. Like, you saved the best part of the pizza for last. Right. Now, turning that water into wine was the first of Jesus' miracles on earth, but it wasn't the last. When we walk with Jesus every day, we become accustomed to his miracles that he performs. He does so many great and wonderful things for us. He supplies everything we need. Like what? What does he give us, Michaela? Yeah, fresh water. Fresh water to drink? What else? Juice packs? What else? <laughs> Pork. Clothes to wear. Guys, do you know what else he gives? Place to live. He gives us mommies and daddies to take care of us. Um, stuffed animals. And those too. Stuffed animals too. Yes. But you know what, Sonny? Even though God gives us all those things, he's saving the best for last too. He is. What is it? Eternal life. When we put our trust in Jesus, we will live with him 
in heaven forever. Everlasting life? Now that's what I call saving the best for last. You got it, son. Miss Lauren, um, now that we know all about how to eat pizza correctly, can the kids and I go downstairs and have a snack? Sure, but first let's pray. Okay. <clears throat> Dear Father, we thank you for all the good things which you provide each and every day for us. But most of all, thank you for saving the best for last. Eternal life with your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen. cast a sideways glance at least at the other readings from the days appointed for us, uh, even though our focus by and large for the past few weeks has been on the reading from the Gospels. But if you've noticed, we've been reading each week now for a bit from the book of 1 Corinthians as that second reading that our lector shares each morning. And as you've perhaps seen in those readings, or as you may recall from my speaking of this book at other times and places, in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul, the apostle and pastor, as Rayan uh, called him in the introduction, uh, has been dealing with the congregation with just about every kind of problem that you can imagine. Um, 1 Corinthians is a great place, as I've often observed. If you're ever feeling like, man, you know, why isn't life easier in the Christian church? Why isn't life simpler in a Christian congregation? Why, why is it not the case that as the people of God, we don't always just get along perfectly? Well, 1 Corinthians is a good antidote to that kind of thinking, realizing that in Bible times, 2,000 years ago, as now, it has never, in fact, really been easy. And... Such is the case in family life, right? Whether it be congregational family in Corinth or now, whether it be a biological family then or now, when you care about people, when it's something that matters to you deeply, that means you're gonna butt heads. Things are not always gonna go easily or smoothly. So Paul's been trying to deal with the issues there, and there are many of them, morality issues, worship issues, divisions of all kinds. And finally, in the reading this morning, as he gets to the 12th chapter, so pretty far into the book, you know, 11 chapters have come and gone before. As he gets to the 12th chapter, he turns to what he puts out to the people of Corinth as the antidote to all the problems. And that is the reminder that the Christian congregational family, whether way back then, in the city of Corinth, or whether right now today, right here, is something deeper than just any old organization. 
Um, you know, you and I both, certainly, we belong to many different kinds of organizations, right? You know, we send money to organizations, we belong to organizations that have meetings of different kinds, events of different kinds. The reality is, over the course of the years, we drift into some, we drift out of others, it changes a bit as the years pass. We've all had that experience. What can unfortunately happen is that our congregational family, the involvement that we have in the life of a family of God's people, can kind of come to seem like just another one. You know, it, it, it can start to seem that it is just another organization in the community, in the area, that does good things. And there are many organizations that do good things. It's not in any way limited to the church it can start to seem like it's just another organization. And, you know, we kind of can drift, or if things get rough for a bit, maybe we just kind of go away and try and find a, a better place. We, we can sort of get the mistaken idea that it's just that simple, that there is not something deeper at work. And so this morning, Paul wants to correct that idea by saying, Whatever it is, flawed as it may be, your involvement in a Christian congregational family is not like any other organization. It's not just something that you kind of drift into and drift out of. It is something, in fact, that God has called you to. And it is something that God has called me to. And it is something much more, according to Paul, like the human body. And just as I learned over the past few weeks that the spleen is pretty darn important. And when it gets aggravated, like I never paid much attention to my spleen, got to tell you. I, I knew it was there, you know, I, I paid attention in health class or anatomy or whatever it was. But I never really gave it a thought till it was kind of in there screaming at me. And saying, you know, I could really mess you up, Tom, you know, you might need surgery, you know, I, I can really make a scene here. I, I really, I really do matter. You don't want to mess with your spleen. I never considered that at all. Not for a moment. Until these past weeks. Just how important that one small, not very flashy, not very attention-getting part of the body can be. And what Paul proceeds to do is to use that image to remind his listeners so long ago and so far away, and to remind us as well, that in fact, each of us, you and me, every single one of us, is not just another name in the book, not just another address in the church directory, not just another envelope number, you know, in the offering plate. We are, in fact, very much more like, and Paul even goes so far as to say we are exactly like parts of the body. And he'll go on in that reading, and I, I won't take the time I considered, you know, we might read through parts of it, but it's fairly lengthy. And if you kind of promised me that maybe you'll get a look at it again this week, like take your celebrate along, you know, put it on the refrigerator, put it on the table. Take another look at it, please, if you would. I'll, I'll leave that on your honor. But what Paul proceeds to do is to say, just like Pastor Tom, you don't want to mess with your spleen, and you don't want to do without your spleen, even though it's maybe not the flashiest organ in the body. You, by golly, better pay attention now, and better remember it matters. And in fact, every other single part of your body matters as well. Whether it's the stuff that you think about all the time, you know, the fingertips or the eyes or whatever, or whether it's something deeper inside quietly going about its work. And just so Paul says it is with a congregational family. You know, it's easy to kind of think, oh, I, I don't really matter, you know? My, I don't have the flashy gifts, I'm never up there reading, you know, up in front of people. Um, I, I wouldn't be comfortable getting up and giving a prayer. Um, 
you know, I don't know, I don't really have the knack of like serving on council and I'm not really maybe a very good singer. And so what does it matter if, if I'm there or not, if I drift away or not? Well, Paul has a word for you and for me. And that is that it matters a whole lot because you are that important part. I am that important part without which the body would not be whole. So when someone is, is gone from the congregational family for a time, even on a given Sunday, you know, when someone isn't present. Um, last week, I think those of us who were here would agree, without those of you who were not able to venture out because of the weather, and we totally understand, it is not the same. It, it, it feels hollow. It's, it, it's, it's as if we're missing a vital part of the body because we are. So each and every single one of us matters, has an important job to do, affects the rest of the congregational family when we're not here. And just like that part of the body needs the rest of the body, needs to be included with us as well. So again, in closing, please, please take the celebrate along Take a look at that reading from 1 Corinthians. This is not the only place that Paul uses the body imagery. He'll do that again in his letter to the Romans. He'll bring up other pieces of language like that in other places in his writing. So you kind of get the idea if you think about it, gosh, if somebody like Paul keeps bringing it up, that must mean it, it's pretty important, number one, and that it's not easy, number two, that it's easy to forget. So please take it, please study it, please read it, please pray it this week, and please know, as Paul reminds us, there's no room to get the swelled head and think, wow, you know, look at me. And there's also no room to feel like I don't matter, I don't, so what if I don't show up? No, this is the body. I'm gonna pay new attention to my spleen. I'm never gonna forget it, I think, honestly. We matter, you matter. Thanks be to God that you have heard that call to be a part of this body. Amen. We uh, respond to God's word first with the words of the new creed. You'll find that printed in your bulletin this morning. Uh, would you please stand if you're able to do so this day. Let us together uh, proclaim whose we are and who we are. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated for the offering and for the anthem by the Senior Choir.
united as one body in Christ, as Paul reminds us. Let us pray for the church, the world, and for all those in need. We pray first, O oh God, for your church. Empower bishops, pastors, deacons, teachers, evangelists, and all members of Christ's body with your spirit. Open our hearts to hear your word of life and respond in lives of service. Bless within our church institutions and family the institutions of higher education of which we are a part at Susquehanna University, Gettysburg College, and the United Lutheran Seminary in Gettysburg and Philadelphia. Bless too, we ask, O oh God, those members of our congregational family who are engaged in higher education at this time, as we pray this day for Caleb and Allison and Shannon and Zachary and Valerie and Timothy and Kamala and Nicholas and Kristen and Gwen and Ben and Jacob. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the earth, for all creatures of the land, air, and water. Heal environments damaged by disaster or pollution. Make us wise stewards of all you have entrusted into our care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations. Liberate us from our captivity to fear and ways of violence. Free those who are unjustly imprisoned and those who are imprisoned for working for freedom. Give us vision to see the pathways of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in need. Rescue, O oh God, those who suffer abuse or neglect. Bring an end to hunger and greed. Accompany those who are alone or vulnerable. Comfort those who grieve and all who are ill. Especially we pray this day for Rosina and Margaret and Warren and Henry and Marzette and Ron, and Janet, and Marlon, and Sue, and Cora, and Eric, and Bob, and Martha, and Tom and Mary Hassinger and their family, and these persons in particular need, whom we now call by name before you, O oh God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for this assembly, this congregational family. Bless those who proclaim your word and those who teach. Bless those whose talents are not recognized, and teach us to honor the gifts of all your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember those who have gone before us in the faith, especially this day, Lydia and Dorcas and Phoebe. Wipe away all tears and bring us with them into the joy of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our prayers, O God, and fill us with the radiance of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray together in his name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord's face shine on us with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Amen.